Hey there church, welcome to the podcast. I'm so glad you found us. We're kicking off a brand new series and today I have our first installment. I trust that God's gonna speak to you over this whole series and specifically today. We'd love to hear about it. Make sure you mention us, make sure you comment. We'd love to know how God is moving in your life. God bless you. How we doing church? We doing good? You feeling good? Excited to be in the house of God, claiming victory, speaking with authority. Let it be so, let it be so. We are in an amazing, amazing season in our church life. And uh, God is up to so much. And I find myself a lot of the time recently just reflecting and thinking about all that God is doing and all that we get to be a part of. You know, it's a, it's a great posture to take when you can just be grateful to know that God's doing something and He lets you come along for the ride. Amen. And uh, God, loves to, God loves to get glory, but He also loves to give glory. Did you know that God likes to let you share in His success and His breakthrough in your life? And when you begin to realize that, it's incredible what you'll begin to see God do and the way He's doing it. You'll recognize God doing stuff that you never, never even acknowledged before. You thought it was all you, but then you'll realize God had it all along, but He's just letting you see it now and illuminate it. And uh, I'm telling you, we're in for good things. God has got so much going on, and uh, it's exciting to be a part of His plan and His purpose. Amen? You ready for the Word of God today? We're starting a new series, and... Uh, I want you to go ahead and open your Bible. If you could, if you got a Bible, would you open up to 2 Peter real quick? And uh, you can just remain standing at all our locations. Let's welcome all our locations from around the world. Can we just give them a hand, Palo Alto? All our campuses and online. We love you and excited that we get to be one church all around the world. That's just cool. That's just cool. Whether it means something in your life or not, whether you care about what's happening in Italy or if you care about even what's happening in Chicago, regardless of your care factor, it's just cool, amen, that we are one church everywhere. And uh, I want to go ahead and set the tone for what I believe God wants to speak, not just today, but for this series. It's in 2 Peter chapter 1, and we're going to go ahead and read from verse 1. It says, this letter is from Simon Peter, a slave and apostle of Jesus Christ. I am writing to you who share the same precious faith we have. This faith was given to you because of the justice and fairness of Jesus Christ, our God and Savior. May God give you more and more grace and peace as you grow in your knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. By His divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know Him, the one who called us to Himself by means of His marvelous glory and excellence. And because of His glory and excellence, He has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share His divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. If you of all this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. Supplement your faith with generous provision of moral excellence and moral excellence with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with patient endurance and patient endurance with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love for everyone. The more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But those who fail to develop in this way are short-sighted or blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their old sins." Today we're beginning a brand new series that we have simply entitled Given. And we've flipped it. We've reversed it because we're going to reverse our approach to giving over this series. And uh, I'm excited. I tell you, I'm excited. I, I, I know what God's got in store and I know that it's going to be powerful in your life. But today I want to begin with a sermon I'm simply entitling Production Team. Production Team. We have a production team here at all our locations, and they wear all black, and I thought I would dress for the sermon today. And, uh, and so we're going to preach about the production team. You ready for the Word of God? Come on, would you act excited at all our locations? Would you find, yeah, would you find, let's say, let's find seven people and just, just tell them how fancy they're looking today in their Sunday outfit. Would you do that real quick? 
Can you flip that? I can't hear it. Wow, that went quiet real quick. <laughs> you do not waste any time at all hugging more than seven people. Just seven. Do not get any more. Amen. So faith is not a feeling. However, faith is an action that you often feel. Wow. And as we come around the Word of God together over this series... I actually, I'm praying, I've been praying a lot. I've been praying that this would be more than a series, that this would actually be a season where we would see and feel faith increasing in our life. You know, whenever I approach a, a series, a sermon really on giving, I am uh, soberly aware of the uphill battle that we have before us simply because of the sensitivity that really is around this particular subject. And for many, even talking about money in church growing up was a taboo subject. So I'm, I'm sure you can understand the resistance that I often feel when it comes to teaching on it. And there is little surprise as to why that there is, there, this topic can be so uncomfortable. In fact, over the years, I've had even many different church leaders and church pastors tell me explicitly how much they hate speaking on giving. And they, they hate it because they simply hate asking their church for money. That's what they tell me. I hate, ask, I hate talking on giving, and I hate it because I don't like asking my church for money. And I tell them always the same thing. I tell them, I, I don't ask my church for money. Yeah. I do, however, give my church many opportunities to unlock a unique aspect of heaven over their lives through stretching in faith, acting in obedience, and applying biblical truths. It's totally different. Because what I have discovered is that there is, there is hardly ever a subject that... That, that makes something sensitive. It's not the subject that makes something sensitive. It's the approach. It's the approach. You see, as we read through the Gospels, you will find that Jesus spoke and taught a lot about money, but His approach was always to unlock freedom, to release blessing, and to illuminate the motives of the heart. And most of the time, the way people approach giving is from a wrong origin, which ultimately will only produce a poor perspective. So over the next few weeks, what we're going to do is we're going to reverse our approach to giving to see if we can't just find some new freedom in the area of finances and also build our faith from a whole new level. And, and I don't know about you, but, but while I, I do love experiencing something new, I love experiencing a brand new season, sometimes I want a particular season to last a little longer. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Like right now, I am trying desperately to hang on to summer, like, like desperately. My family are totally into fall. Like they have all the fall feels. They have all the fall planning. I mean, in our home, it is like, it's even though like earlier this week was 100 degrees, they were still had sweaters on, you know, in hope that the change would come. And uh, we've got pumpkin spice everything going on in our home. We've got candles and, and like we've been holding out on pumpkins. But man, the girls, every time we go to the store, they're like, Dad, pumpkins. I'm like, I know, just hang on. And uh, they're wishing and they are willing fall season into our home. In fact, we have a whole fall activity list. We've got a full calendar that my girls have put together of full programming for the Smokham family, okay? All the activities that I can expect to be a part of. And we've already begun. Last weekend, in fact, we did the first fall activity, and we've never done this. It was brand new for our family. We did apple picking, okay? We did apple picking. And uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a fun activity, I will say this. We went out to this farm and we picked some apples. These are some of the apples that we picked on the farm. What's left, in fact, we picked bags of them. They were delicious. And it was a fascinating experience going out picking apples. I, I realized midway into the apple picking experiment that I wasn't there to pick apples. I was there as photographer. <laughs> I'm starting to clue on, you know. Like, Dad, let's go do this. Can you take photos? I, I realize I'm capture team for my family. And, uh, and, and it's interesting because what I began to notice is people were going crazy, you know, just picking apples. And, and the idea in my mind was you look at the apple you want to pick, then you pick it. But I saw, I was getting real concerned with the amount of waste that was going on. I'm going to be honest with you. 
Because I saw people just out there picking apples, and after they picked them, they would check them, realize, I don't want that one, and they would just throw them. Anybody else get disturbed by that kind of business? Anybody else a little bit troubled by the fact that people, are, in fact, there wasn't just, there were so many apples on the ground, and it wasn't just people discarding them, wasteful, want not people. It, the apples were falling on their own. Like, like, I was about to pick an apple, and an apple fell. And I just was like, I didn't do that, guys. Like, that wasn't me. It just fell all on its own. And as we're walking around, apples are just falling all over the place. And so we get our apples, and we go back to the little store that they had in the little farmhouse. And as my girls were, like, they're buying everything, man. They're buying apple butter. They're buying, they're buying apple juice. They're anything with apple in front of it. And these guys have commercialized the farm well. I'm telling you, they're making bank off my family. And, uh, <laughs> and while they're picking apple products... I had an opportunity to speak to this old guy. I think he was the farmer. I don't know his name. Let's just call him Farmer Bill. And uh, I was speaking to Farmer Bill because he, he, he spoke to me first. He's like, he said, looks like you got some good apples there. Kind of proud of his product. You know what I mean? He was pretty proud. Looks like you got some good apples there. And I, I felt to offer my, my frustration with all the waste. Because I, I thought I'd connect with him, you know, as a CEO of his organization all the waste, and maybe there was a way I could suggest some improvements around here if he really wants to maximize his product. And I said, yeah, you know, we did, but it's a real shame about all the waste, talking about the apples on the ground. And he said something fascinating to me. He said, no, they're not wasted. And then he told me something that I'm not going to tell you just yet. <laughs> because it was so good that I have to use this whole sermon to set it up. <laughs> so you have to stay for the sermon. But I'm telling you, it was good. And, and you see, I actually found a scripture that backs up and sets up what Farmer Bill, is that what we call it? Farmer Bill said, because this passage we have here from Peter is actually a detailed description or a well-processed explanation, in fact, of how faith actually functions. You see, in fact, Faith is the one thing that God wants you to get more of. Throughout the Gospels and the interactions that we see Jesus have is we see several different instances where Jesus seems to be disappointed. On different occasions, whether it was with the disciples or with the Pharisees or with his hometown, we see he expresses his frustration through the sentence, ye of little faith. How many people have heard or said or read Jesus see that? Maybe you saw it in a movie. Maybe that's why you heard it. Ye of little faith. Ye of, ye of little faith. And it's almost kind of like in a little frustrated tone. Ye, oh, ye of little faith. Talking to the disciples. I feel like the disciples heard that a lot. He, the Pharisees certainly heard it a lot. Ye of little faith. Every time Jesus wanted to do something, even even when being betrayed by Judas, Jesus wasn't nearly as disappointed as he was with the apparent lack of faith within the people of God. There was even, you know, a setting where, where Jesus couldn't even do any miracles because of the lack of and the limited faith that he found, which can kind of be a little bit confusing when Scripture clearly reveals that it is actually God who gives faith. I mean, this is what we see from really the start of this letter that Peter explains. He, he explained that God is the one that gives faith. Let me, let me show you, because he first starts out the letter by saying, this is, this is from Simon Peter, a slave and an apostle of Jesus Christ. I'm writing you who share the same precious faith we have. This faith was given to you. Did you get that? This faith was given to you. Because of the justice and the fairness of Jesus Christ, our God and Savior. So Peter wants you to know faith is a gift from God. Are you writing notes already? I'm going to do my best to teach you. Every time Jesus spoke on giving, he never preached to people. He always taught. So I'm going to take that tone today. So feel free to take notes in church. This is going to be helpful in your life, in your giving, in your perspective of what God wants to do in your life. And Peter wants you to know that, that faith is a gift from God. Even Paul, the apostle, puts it this way in Ephesians 2.8. He says, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. So if God is the one that gives faith, how is it that we can have too little faith? 
Well, what Peter learned as a disciple from walking with Jesus and, and being with Jesus and the different situations that they found themselves in is, is that while God is the one who gives faith, we are the ones who grow it. Can I say that again? While God is the one who gives faith, we are the ones who grow faith. We're the ones who grow it. God gives it, you grow it. Look at your neighbor real quick. Find your favorite neighbor. Say, God gives it. Now look back at them and say, yeah, but you grow it. You grow it. You have a part to play. And as a personal case study, we could even use Peter as our subject matter. Because Peter here is speaking from experience. Because Peter, what you'll know is, he, he was the one who went from trusting Jesus to cast his net out onto the water to now having the faith to be the very one to walk out on that same water himself. And what's funny about the way faith grows is that it's only ever developed in seeming opposition. Did you realize that? I mean, it would be nice, wouldn't it, if we could, could see our faith gains by the way we see muscle gains. Just start flexing in the mirror and see how much your faith has grown, but... But faith isn't actually seen that way. It'd be nice. It'd be nice because I'm sure my wife would appreciate it. You know, she was, she was a couple, uh, couple months ago now suggesting some uh, improvements I could make to my physique, in fact. <laughs> it wasn't even a conversation we were having. She just came out and said it. <laughs> no finesse. <laughs> just like, you can work on your biceps. That's what she said, literally. No context, yeah, you should, you should furrow your brow at her. And she just decided, you could work on your biceps. I said, okay. Do I get to suggest anything? She said, no. <laughs> I see how this goes. And so I was pondering on it and pondering on it and pondering on it. And, and we were on a flight together. And uh, this was literally, I think, like the day after she suggested this. It was the day after. And... Uh, and, uh, and we, got, we got separated. She was sitting a few rows back. I was in first class. And uh, <laughs> go do your dues, you know. <laughs> Comment on my biceps, huh? <laughs> Anyhow, uh, she was a couple rows back. And, uh, and as it was time to get off, there was this, this lady who was trying to get her bag down. And just being a servant of the Lord, I thought it would be great to help her out. And as I, as I grabbed the suitcase and pulled it down, one arm, by the way, uh, <laughs> she said, my, how, how strong you are. <laughs> Literally, mid-air, I just looked back at Kira. <laughs> and slowly... Placed it, placed it down. But you know, faith isn't something that you can flex. Did you know that? Faith is something that has to be functioning. In order to see it, it has to be functioning. It's just not something that you can flex on people. Say, check out my faith. You see my faith level? Just front up on them and start flexing that faith muscle. You have to be functioning in it for faith to be evident, and I'm wondering if in one sense, while faith is developed, I wonder if in another sense, faith is discovered. See, last Sunday, I got the privilege of preaching in our Oakland campus. Can we give a shout out to Oak Town? I mean, what are you gonna know about Oak Town? Oak Town are surprisingly good looking, but they're also rowdy, okay? They're a rowdy bunch. So if y'all don't start speaking back to me, I'm gonna go preach this thing in Oakland from now on. We'll broadcast from there, amen? Because they they, they're, they're a rowdy bunch. They make a, feel, a preacher feel good about himself. And I was talking about the purpose of God. I was talking about how we often view the purpose of God as a path or a place that God leads us to. That the, that the purpose of God for my life, we've got this place in mind, this, this position that we'll be in, this pathway that if I find the purpose of God, I find myself on a path. And it is. But, but, but I also reveal that the purpose of God is not just a, a discovering a path, but it's also discovering what we possess. This is very, very important for us to understand if we're going to really get aligned with what God has for your life. Because what Peter wants you to know, and he unpacks for us in this passage, is, is before revealing how we develop our faith, he first helps us discover what we already 
have. Can, can I show you something? I got a teaching screen today because I wanted to make sure I taught you something about this scripture. And what Peter wants you to know is he says this. He says, and he emphasizes it in emphatic ways. He makes sure he comes at you from every angle possible. He says, by His divine power, God has given. That's an important one. God has given everything we need for living a godly life. We have, context, received all of this by coming to know Him, the one who has called us to Himself by means of His marvelous glory and excellence. And because of His glory and excellence, He has given. That's great context. Great and precious promises. These are promises that enable you to share in His divine nature, escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. What He wants you to know is that what God's got for you, He's already given. I, I was telling Oakland, God would not be a great game designer. Because a good game designer leads you to the next level. Because if I get the next level, I, not only do I cheat, but I unlock something. I, I, I unlock lock a blessing. I, I unlock a prize. I unlock a tool. I unlock a weapon. There is something that we unlock every level that we graduate. But the way God builds games or this life is He just gives you everything from the beginning. <laughs> Terrible game designing. No incentive to keep going. But God says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to front load it from the start. In fact, I'm going to give you everything you need in this life for every level, every stage, every obstacle, every opponent, every enemy, every level, every devil. God's going to say, I'm going to give it to you all from the beginning. Right from the start, I'm going to front load it for you. And check it out. This is how he does it. Ephesians 1.3, it says, Or praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. He front loads it. That means, and that helps me understand the reason God allows me to go through opposition. Because opposition now serves my purpose. You thought opposition was, was the enemy's purpose. God is... But by front-loading you with everything from the beginning, God doesn't just create a, a, a blessed life. God isn't just trying to give you a, a cruisy life. No, no, God is hijacking the enemy's plans for your destruction and making them serve His plan that you would be forced when you come up against opposition to begin to discover exactly what it is that you had. Because you've got this great big bag of tricks. You've got this great big bag of blessing. You have all these tools. You have all these weapons that God has given it. But guess what? You don't even know about it. You are completely unaware of all the things that you have in Christ Jesus. But now that you've come up against opposition, you start digging for stuff. You start searching for stuff. You start frantically looking, okay, God, what do I do in this situation? God says, guess what? I've already given it to you. Claim authority. Use your anointing. Begin to preach blessing. I've already given it. Start reaching back. And if you never faced opposition, you never reach in to discover what it is that you already have. God, God, God blesses you. God blesses you. Peter discovered this when he stepped out in the boat. Out of the boat, you know. I've I've been out, I've been I've been on the Sea of Galilee twice now, and uh, both times I've seen people try to walk on the same water that Peter did and failed. <laughs> I might have encouraged them a little bit. <laughs> I might have said, Vance, you don't have as much faith as Peter, <laughs> and he doesn't. <laughs> he sunk, and uh, and every time. The, uh, the boat driver says the same thing, like almost like a skeptic. You know, he's out on the Sea of Galilee like a skeptic. You know what I mean? He's like, I've seen hundreds, probably thousands of people try this, and, and nobody does it. And I was thinking about that statement, and uh, I said to him, well, well maybe it's too calm. Because he only drives the boat on the nice days. M maybe, it's, maybe it's not their faith. Maybe it's the situation. Because everyone's trying to walk out on calm water. See, when Peter stepped out, the Bible says the waves were raging and they were afraid for their lives. What if for faith to be fully discovered, it, it needs some kind of storm or a stretch? What, what if faith is never built in comfortable situations, in calm seasons? What if, what if faith is formed fastest 
in the face of fear. In fact, let me take it a little bit deeper. What if it's the presence of fear that you discover what it is that I have from God and what isn't from God? Like, like, like Paul discovered when he wrote to Timothy about a timid season that he was in in his life. He says in 2 Timothy 1, 7, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of self-discipline. If it wasn't for a season of fear, he wouldn't have the premise to write to him that that fear is not from God. Let me show you what you do have. In other words, the circumstance around your life will reveal what is from God and what isn't from God. If you just lean into it. And here Peter is helping us in the process of discovery by telling us that we have everything we need for living this life. And not only does Peter make sure we know what we have, he also makes sure we understand where it, it, it comes from. Where it comes from. Because what we have here is several different instances. What he illuminates is he makes sure that you know it's by His divine power that God has given us. Let's just break this down for a moment. This is important. Everything we need for living a godly life, we have received all of this coming to know Him, uh, to know Him, the one who called us to Himself by means of His marvelous glory and excellence. And because of His glory and excellence, He, talking about God, has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share in His. It's His divine power, His divine glory, His divine blessing, His divine promises, His stuff. God is creating a partnership. And what, what, what Peter is making sure that you are aware of here is that he is making a context and a collaboration and a connection to God as the source. Write this down in your own notes, that God is the source we are the recipients. I'm going to run out of room. We are the recipients. God is the source. We are the recipients. Actually, studying the Bible, you will see this pattern throughout the whole Bible, throughout Scripture. Even right from the beginning, you will see that the, the Bible begins with this pattern. In Genesis 1.1, it says, In the beginning, God. That from the origin of everything, God is your source. And this is not just descriptive or a descriptive narrative of how you know, things got started. It is also prescriptive for the way we're meant to approach this life. That in order to fully grasp what God is doing in your life, it requires the perspective of Him as the source. In fact, maybe I could just teach this for a moment with the tithe. Because the tithe gets so much debate amongst internet scholars who, <laughs> who love to argue that the tithe is a law requirement. It is, it is so fascinating to me how people will manipulate and twist a limited perspective of law and grace understand, misunderstanding and will be so vehemently apl- applicable to their passionate theological, theological studies to something that will get them out of doing something. Because the whole premise of grace is not what we've got to do, but what we get to do. But yet we'll take a very law mentality and approach it and appropriate our grace understandings through that filter. In fact, we know because we are no longer under the law that the the, the tithe is no longer required. You know that, don't you? I'll show you. Because here we've got in Genesis 14... You will see that Abram, after a great battle and a great victory, he, he, he gives one-tenth of everything that he has to the, the priest Melchizedek in acknowledgement and, and, and understanding that it was God in recognition and response to the victory that came from the Lord. He recognized God as his source. In other words, he's like, yeah, I got some skills, but not that many skills. That was God. This was all God. God, you got the victory. So you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to honor the Lord by recognizing his provision, his power, his skill set. If it had not been for the Lord, I wouldn't have the victory. So the least I can do is honor the Lord with the first tenth of everything that I have. I'm going to bring it back to the Lord. Just as saying, God, I acknowledge you. God, I'm giving you a shout out right now. God, I'm going to give you the glory because I recognize you as the source. Abraham was not fooled. And it is very foolish to go through this life looking at what you've got, what you've gained, what you've accredited, what you've accumulated and say, man, I'm good. 
to not acknowledge God, to not acknowledge the fact that He is the one who gave you the very breath in your lungs. If it's not even the mentality that you have, the ability to educate and the ability to earn wealth, even if it's just for the breath of my lungs, God, I'm so grateful that I'm walking this earth and sucking air. I am so grateful that you are for me and not against me. I am so grateful, God, let me acknowledge you in all my ways. This is what Abram does. He gives one-tenth in response and in recognition of God as the source, God as the source of power, God as the source of provision, God as the source of protection. And so what was a response for Abram did later become a requirement under Mosaic law. The law, which simply means a list of minimum requirements for God's people to pass as acceptable. That's what the law is. The law was like all these minimum requirements. In other words, what is the bare minimum I have to do to get away with being acceptable? Because it was so hard for the people of God to acknowledge God that under law, because they had to came out of slavery, they had to be given a basic level educational understanding of this is what the Lord considers acceptable. And it was always a bare minimum. If you just do this, you, you'll get through. And, and so the people of God began to operate under that minimum mindset that if I could just do, and it became getting to the law and no more, to the minimum level and no more. And so that was a pattern that we see that was established amongst the people of God under Mosaic law. Under Abram was out of an overflow, became under a a, a, a bondage under the law. What is the bare minimum I have to get away with? Now what we see under grace is there is still a response required when recognizing God. Because God is still the source. As long as God is the source, recognition is going to be required. And what was the most that I had to do under the law would not then be less under the privilege of grace in what I get to do. Are you with me? I like the way Peter puts it in verse 5. He says, in view of all this, make every effort to respond. Make every effort to respond to to, to, to God's promises. If God has put promises in your life, if God has put blessing in your life, that should enact a response as the people of God. If God has put breakthrough in your life, if God has put provision, protection, if there are things that you can acknowledge, God, I'm looking for some head nods and amens, like people have been blessed, that people know what it is to walk with God and get His provision in their life. If God has done something in your life, Peter says, hey, this would be a, a great position to make every effort to respond to God. I, I, I love the way Jesus puts it. Because under law, it was, it, it was 10% of your income came back to God. So I wonder what would be a reasonable response under grace. Jesus said it this way. When talking about the law, he was confronting the law police because the law police came against Jesus all the time. They didn't have internet, but they were still around. And in Matthew 5.28, Jesus says, you've heard the commandment because he's talking about the law. The Ten Commandments. He says, you've heard the commandment that says you must not commit adultery. Jesus said, but I say anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Jesus doesn't take the law and then diminish it. Jesus took what was the standard of the law and lifts it. He takes it even further. And so under grace, is the tide still relevant? Well, of course it is, but what was an expectation is now an expression of recognition of God as your source. So so hear me right. Do we have to tithe? No. Can I still be a Christian and not tithe? Yes. Does God still love me if I don't tithe? Yes. Yes. Am I still blessed if I don't touch? Yes, because God already blessed you. He blessed you with every spiritual blessing. He already gave you all the blessings before you did anything. His blessings weren't dependent on what you did. They were blessed on His goodness. God is not a God who says, I'll give if you give. God says, I'm already given. I'm already given. Let me set the model for you to follow in. I've already given. God, give, God, God is a giver. He set the, he set the pace. He Set the course. In fact, he gave everything. He gave his own life. God God has already given. Well, 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 if I don't have to, why tithe? 
Why give out of your hard-earned money? (laughs) Why is it important? In fact, let me take it deeper. Why does God need recognition? It doesn't sound very godly to me to need acknowledgement. Is God that insecure that he wants you to tag him with the tithes and to mention him with your giving? In fact, what I know about God is he doesn't need anything. Scripture tells us that. Scripture tells us he's the supplier of our needs. So while our giving is to God, you need to make sure you know it's not for God. Our giving holds incredible significance for us. You see, oh, this is, this is going to help somebody. This is, going to, this, is, this is going to help somebody. When we give to God, we recognize Him as the source. That's essentially and primarily what you're doing in your life when you come with your first tenth. And if we just want to live by the minimum requirements, that's where you stay. But if you're under grace and you let the, the, the acknowledgement and the provision of God, then that's just the starting point, really. But when we come with our giving to God, we're, we're essentially understanding and recognizing and acknowledging Him as the source. And this begins to change things in your life. This begins to change things, not just in your finances. Would I be so poorly preaching to, to say that this is just a financial? That there is protection just not as much as there is provision. There is the power of God for breakthrough just as much as there is provision. Because let's be honest, when we approach our finances and our money, the premise is ours. So when we give, we see it as something that is coming from us. In fact, that's why it feels like spending. <laughs> so as people give like, all right, we give. It feels like you just spent money. But the apple farmer the other day told me something. Bill, that's what we called him. Farmer, farmer Bill helped me articulate something the way I had never, ever been able to do before. And... And, and I, I'm going to share it with you. And it's the same way that Peter does it here in this passage. It's been there the whole time. You probably haven't even seen it. Because after illuminating God as the source and instructing us to grow in our faith, he says in verse 8, can we put this up on the big screen? I don't want the small screen for this. I want the big screen. He says, verse, verse 8, can you go ahead and put that up there? I'm going to wait for you because I don't want anybody to miss this. It's very, very important. He says, the more you grow like this, The more God likes you. No, it doesn't actually say that. But that's what we think, right? We think that our giving makes God like us more. That that's the way blessing works in our life. That if I'm a good and faithful servant and and I give every week, then God's a happy God and He smiles upon me and I feel blessed because God's just like, "Mm, I'm so proud of you. Blessing, you know. (laughs) That's how we, that's, that's how we think. That's how we, that's how we, like, see God? Faithful servant, well done. Good and faithful. But there are some blessings held up just for those who give every week. It'd be easy to preach if it said, if you do this, the more you grow like this, the more God's going to like you. We all want to be liked by God. But the truth is, there's nothing you can do to make God like you more. He already loves you unconditionally. This this is like, it's not even like, it's love. Like, God is that guy. He's he's just all hard. He loves you. Whether you give or not, whether you acknowledge Him or not. I mean, God, you can... You can go through this whole life never acknowledging God and He'll still love you. That's pretty freeing. That's freeing for anybody who came in here thinking, man, we're going to hear a condemnational giving sermon and I'm now have to give. I'm going to write checks reluctantly and tear it out. and Fine. It doesn't say that. It says, oh, where'd you go? Put it back up. The more you grow like this, the more productive and useful. I don't have time to get to the second one, but that word productive, 
that would productive. That 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 is a it's a word that can be broken down in so many ways that there is there is a production team here, Vive Church, that make this whole thing happen. That on the other side they're all waving like, yay, we're significant. <laughs> We're never seen, <laughs> but today, soak it in. The more pro- we're a production team, they make things happen. We all like the idea of being productive. We don't like waste, and, and that's what really caught my attention when I was talking about the waste to farm a uh, bill, and and I, I love it because we pick these apples. And I've been, I've been eating these, these apples. I've been eating these apples a lot. They're delicious, delicious apples. And when I was talking to Farmer Bill, I literally said to him, it's a shame about the waste. That so many apples are being wasted. And he said, no, they're, they're not wasted. And then he said, and I need you to get this in your spirit like it hit me in my spirit. He said, this is why at the store, They call them produce. Because when it falls off a tree or sits on a shelf, it still has the power to produce. It sat with me for a moment and I just said, okay. But as I walked away, I wanted to go back and just slap a 20 on him for the revelation that he gave me because (laughs) I realized that I've been eating these apples. I need someone to help me. Uh, mate, so you want to just help me out? Yeah, just come up here because I trust you with a knife. Come up here. And if you could just like cut one of those apples for me because it, it hit me only later as I was thinking about what he actually meant for, because he's a farmer. What does he know about preaching? But as I realized what he was talking about is that you could just eat all these apples in your bag. We picked some nice apples and we enjoyed them. But what I began to realize is that as you open the apple, and you all know this, you've eaten an apple or two in your life, there are these teeny tiny little black seeds in here. And, and you could look at that and go, what a waste of space in this apple. Like, the core, I hate the core. Anybody hate the core? You know, you have to cut around it and you have to eat around it and there's seeds in there. But what he realized is that you could just eat it and it would be fruit. Or you could sow it because it's got seeds and it will do something in your life. See, what God wants you to do is He wants you to look at the apple in your hand. He wants you to look at the the finances in your hand. He wants you to look at what He's put in your hand and you can consume that so easily and it will flourish in your life. God will use it to bless your life, to sustain you in your life. But there is a portion of what God gives you that He wants you to realize that He's actually given you seed. Now, Now, stay with me. The seed is the very thing that takes it from fruit and helps you recognize the source. And when you bring the seed back to the source, it changes what you've got to be resource. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a replication of what God first put in, because He's the source. Now He turns you into the image of God uh, what does Peter says? He says, add to faith, goodness, add to goodness, knowledge, add to knowledge, self-control, add to self-control, patience, add to, self, add, add to patience, endurance, add to endurance, brotherly affection, add to, add to uh, brotherly affection, love for everyone. That means be like God. He says, when you get to a level where you begin to acknowledge God in your life, you begin to be like God because He is the source. He gives you resource. He gives you the power like God to produce on this earth. He gives you the power to take something 
and not just be the consumer, but to be the producer in this life and begin to be productive. He's giving you an invitation to join the production team and say, are we gonna produce something in this life? Are you gonna go through this life just being a waster, just being a consumer, like the people who pick and throw aside? Or are you gonna be the people who plant? Are you gonna be the people who sow? Are you gonna be the people like God that begin to acknowledge Him and turn your resource into something that will produce something in this life? It's powerful. Farmer Bill. Farmer Bill. Stand to your feet with me. Stand to your feet every location. I need to connect the dots because what we see is this is when faith begins to function. Remember we said faith works best in fearful situations. And and guess what? You can do nothing in life and opposition's gonna come. So guess what? Good news There are gonna be ample opportunities ahead of you in your life. I'm not doom and gloom preacher. I'm not talking end times. I'm talking in this life. There are gonna be ample opportunities for you to dig into your bag of tricks and pull out the weapon that you need in that moment to pull out the blessing that God gave you. There are gonna be so many opportunities coming along. It's gonna happen. And you can sit and you can wait for fear to come. Or you can stretch in your faith and you invite an opportunity. You can wait for an opportunity or you can invite because faith grows in fear. Faith also grows in a stretch. You choose, you choose. You cho- Do you wanna wait for fear to come and then you're frantically trying to figure out who's my source and where is my provision? Do I have something in this bag? Or you can begin to stretch in your faith and simply invite the, the fact that God is your source and a constant reminder that I have given you the power to produce. I love you. It's not a question of love. Giving's not a question of love. It's a question of productiveness. I don't even have time to get to the effectiveness and the usefulness. I'm just trying to get something into the culture and the heartbeat of our church. That we don't get it twisted, that we don't come and give out of obligation, that we don't give because we feel like that's Christian tax or Christian duty or trying to find idiosyncrasies to connect some obscure dots in the Word to get us out of giving. You don't want to give, don't give. In fact, Jesus says that. Don't give reluctantly. It's scriptural. Do not give if it's in reluctance. If you don't want to, don't do it. But if you want to be productive in this life and you want to be useful in this kingdom and you want the very source of heaven to be recognized every step and you want to take what God has given you that seems fleeting and seems like it disappears and seems like you have to keep making more, if you want that to actually produce something in your life, God says, recognize me as the source. Bring it back to me. Bring it back to me and watch what I will do in your life. I will take what is simply mere giving and I will make it a resource to produce more and to have blessing and to make change and to shift things. This is powerful.